Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, also known as ASTO, I would like to thank you for participating in today's webinar entitled, Are You Ready to Sail Your Ship? Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive the link to review the presentation once it is posted to our website. My name is Denise Pavletic and I'm the Director of Public Health Systems Improvement at ASTO and will be moderating and presenting uh, today's session. This webinar is the third in a series of four webinars that ASTO is hosting around the topic of developing a state health improvement plan. Today's webinar is brought to you through funding and partnership between ASTO and the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Office of State, Territor State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support. The content of this webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position of or endorsement by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Additionally, the information provided in this webinar is intended to be consistent with FAB requirements and documentation guidance. However, ASTO cannot guarantee that states who follow the guidance in this document will meet FAB requirements as only the FAB site visitors can make that determination. Our objectives for today are uh, to develop a process for prioritizing strategic issues for inclusion in your ship, locate resources for developing a prioritization process, identify strategies for communicating ship priorities to key agency stakeholders, and identify ways to gather feedback from the public on ship priorities. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be directed to a link to answer a few questions on how well we've met these objectives. In the spirit of our own quality improvement, we very much value your feedback. So please take a few moments to complete the evaluation. We're very excited today to bring you um, today's webinar. We um, have um, our colleagues have joined us from the state of Alabama and Oklahoma. And we look forward to a robust Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if I can take a moment to orient you to the ReadyTalk platform, there are two ways in which you can submit your questions. The first is through the chat function located in the lower left corner of your, of your screen. You can submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using this function. So let's get some audience participation using the chat feature. Uh, right now we have about 30 people have joined us on the webinar today. So if you would, through the chat function, type in the, the name of your agency and the city. And I'll, I'll go ahead and start us off. Great. So I see some folks from Michigan, New Jersey, Missouri, Oregon, Alabama. <laughs> uh, we've got Davis County in Utah, New York State Department of Health. Puerto Rico has joined us again. Hello, Puerto Rico. Glad you could join again. Um, Maryland, South Carolina. Okay, great. So um, feel free to, to use that function to submit your questions as we go through the presentation. Thank you for indulging me in that. Um, the second option is to hold your questions until the end of the presentation, at which time our operator will open up the lines for you to address the presenters. Again, we're very happy to have our colleagues from Alabama and Oklahoma presenting on today's webinar. Our first presenter is Carolyn Byrne. Carolyn Byrne is with the Alabama Department of Public Health where she is establishing the Department of Community Affairs. 
Initially, this new department will be focusing on how the department builds the capacity of the healthcare system collectively to improve the health of, of Alabama citizens. Of note, Ms. Byrne created the Voluntary Certification Program for the Kids and Kin Initiative, a program named by ABT and Associates as one of the 150 national innovative initiatives funded by states. She currently serves on the boards of the Alabama Rural Health Association, the statewide AHEC Advisory Committee, the Alabama Public Health Association, and the Alabama Communities of Excellence Advisory Committee. Ms. Byrne graduated cum laude from Vanderbilt University with a degree in economics and has a master in public administration from Auburn University at Montgomery. Our spe second speaker today is James Allen. James is the Director of Partnerships for Health Improvement within the Oklahoma State Department of Health. He has 17 years of public health service, having worked both in state government and higher education. Uh, Mr. Of, of note, Mr. Allen is a master trainer with QPR Institute, a national and international provider of suicide intervention training. He is currently the president of the Oklahoma Public Health Association and past president of the Southwest College Health Association and he received his MPH from the University of Oklahoma. So again, thank you for um, James and Carolyn for joining us today. Uh, just a quick background on our State Health Improvement Plan Guidance and Resource. Um, we released this in the summer of 2015 as a sequel to the State Health Assessment Guidance and Resources released in 2014. And so ASTO would like to recognize the partnership with our colleagues at the Illinois Public Health Institute in creating this guide. And we want to also recognize our expert SHIP advisory committee who provided invaluable input into this resources. And uh, some, I see that some of you are on this call today. So thank you for joining. Where do you find this resource? Uh, your first step is to go to www.astro.org. You're going to click on the Programs link and then click on Accreditation and Performance. This will bring you to um, the Accreditation and Performance landing page where you'll click on the Tools Clearinghouse under Resources and you'll see the arrow there at the bottom of the screen. And of note here is that the Tools Clearinghouse section has several resources in it, including case studies, toolkits, peer network information, quality connection newsletters, webinars, sample SHAW ships and strategic plans, presentations and fact sheets, and an accreditation library where we house example accreditation documentation by standard and measure. So once you've clicked on Tools, uh, the, the uh, Tools Clearinghouse um, link, it will bring you here to our landing page. And if you look at the very bottom, you'll see a link to download the document. And to give you a heads up, you will be prompted to input your, your name, your agency name, and your email address before the download, and we're using this information to provide follow-up on the toolkits and to use for our evaluation of the toolkits. Again, our customer input is very important to us, so we appreciate your feedback. Some highlights of the resource. Um, the, the SHIP resource has seven modules. Identifying and engaging stakeholders, engaging in visioning and systems thinking, leveraging data inputs, establishing priorities and identifying issues, communicating about SHIP priorities, developing objective strategies and measures, and implementing and monitoring the SHIP. And so today our focus will be on Module 4, which is establishing priorities, and Module 5, communicating SHIP priorities. 
more highlights of the SHIP Guidance and Resource Document. Each module contains a preview of the content, the relevant FAB stand, standards and measures, ideas for structuring the planning process, important considerations, key terms and acronyms, and most importantly, state examples and lessons learned, and as well as sample tools and links to resources. And then throughout the document, uh, we cross-reference the State Health Assessment Guidance and Resources document as well. Each module has an extensive list of resources and links related to the module topic. And each module contains the relevant reference to the FAB Standard 5.2. And we also reference other related standards throughout the resource. And last, each module contains a section on important considerations again with links to relevant resources. So before I jump into Module 4 on establishing priorities, uh, let's get some participation from the audience. We have a polling question here, and we're asking you what type of prioritization method or methods have you used in your SHIP? So we'll take a few seconds here to let you vote. And you can, you can select more than one option. Okay, how about five more seconds and I'll close the poll. Okay, great. So you all should be able to see the bar graph there. Um, looks like majority of you are using a prioritization matrix. Uh, we have a close, well, we have a tie between the nominal group technique um, and we haven't started prioritization. Um, we have a tie between the strategy grid and other. So um, it will be helpful if maybe, we, maybe those of you who have used other methods um, to share that with us at the end of the presentation. And then the QSort, QSort method, um, we will be hearing more about that from Carolyn in Alabama. Okay, Module 4. Prioritizing the strategic issues into a manageable number is important for focusing efforts and allocating resources to produce impact and outcomes. This module provides guidance, resources, and tips for designing and managing collaborative multi-stakeholder prioritization processes. And here is a high-level overview of the um, prioritization process. Uh, I'm not going to read each step out loud, but just give you some general information here. Each state's SHIP partnership will likely take a unique approach to prioritizing its issues. There are a number of, of useful prioritization processes and decision-making tools that groups can utilize. During your state health assessment process, the State Health Department, the State Health Assessment Partnership, and stakeholders may have developed findings at a high level and, and a high level subset of health issues from your State Health Assessment results. It is important to review those findings and other data and identify cross-cutting issues, themes, or areas of concern. Because they emerge from multiple types of assessments, Cross-cutting issues are likely the most strategic issues to address. Once these, are, once these are identified, utilizing a prioritization process will help the partnership narrow and focus on the plan's priorities. One key foundational step for any prioritization process is developing prioritization criteria or prioritization considerations. 
And so what you see before you is from our guidance. Figure 4.1 shares a range of criteria that are used by health departments and their partners during the prioritization process. The broad categories represent common types of criteria, and each column includes specific ways of defining the criteria that the project team might consider. The State Health Assessment Guidance and Resources uses a similar set of criteria for developing findings from the Health Status Assessment. During the SHIP process, applying these criteria to the subset of issues developed from the SHOP findings or the identified cross-cutting strategic issues can help narrow the list of priorities for inclusion in the SHIP. In terms of prioritization considerations, uh, the SHIP Executive Committee should select and provide clearly defined criteria to stakeholders during the prioritization process. Here in Figure 4.2, uh, we show an example of a handout with definitions for criteria. These types of handouts are useful to distribute to all stakeholders so everyone is on the same page while decisions are made to narrow down and prioritize key issues from the SHAW findings. And if possible, the SHIP partnership should also be engaged in reflecting on and contributing to the criteria that will be used for prioritization. Here are some commonly used prioritization techniques. Uh, the nominal group technique is a very popular method that helps groups make decisions and ensures that all meeting participants have the opportunity to provide input into the process. This technique can also help if there are vocal members that dominate the discussion and decision making process. The nominal group technique is often used when a group wants to generate ideas and then narrow them down to a more concise set. A skilled facilitator supplies for recording and voting and clear understanding of the ground rules for the process are critical for success with the nominal group technique. A prioritization matrix is a simple way to quantify priority scores for health problems while considering a number of criteria. So, uh, the first step would be to create a matrix and list all prominent health issues down the y-axis and the criteria across the x-axis so that each row is represented by a health issue and each column is represented by a criterion. Next, include an additional column to track the priority score. Each, each person will then rate each health issue against the criterion then you'll want to assign weights to each criterion by level of importance, and then calculate the scores for each health problem by adding the scores across the row, and then assign a ranking scale to each health problem with the highest priority score being 1 and the lowest priority score being 4. The Hamlin method, also known as the basic priority rating system, is a frequently used approach for prioritizing health issues, often in combination with other methods. The Hanlon method uses three criteria, magnitude, seriousness, and effectiveness of intervention. In a simple equation that adds the rating for magnitude to the rating for seriousness, and then multiplies that sum by the intervention's effectiveness to arrive at a final rating. The strategy grid is a, tr is a tool to prioritize two important criteria selected by the group. Since this tool only focuses on two criteria, it is not recommended to use it as the final way to prioritize issues. However, it can be helpful in narrowing in on key issues in combination with the nominal group technique or the prioritization matrix. This tool can help prioritize strategies or activities to address an issue, especially if using the criteria cost versus impact or cost versus feasibility. And then again, uh, later on we will hear from Carolyn in Alabama and how they used the Q sort method. 
Um, all of these technique descriptions are outlined in detail in the Developing a State Health Improvement Plan Guidance and Resource Document. Jumping into to Module 5, uh, this is around communicating your priorities. Uh, the State Health Department should communicate their SHA and SHIP in ways that speak to a range of audiences particularly those who have an interest in community health throughout the state. Specifically, the SHA and SHIP should be presented in a manner that is useful to public health professionals working at state, local, and tribal health departments, public health system partners across a range of sectors from education, transportation, economic development, et cetera, and then finally to the general public. That provides specific guidance about communicating and seeking input on SHA findings. In Measure 1.1.2, the guidance states that the Health Department must provide opportunity for the state population at large to review drafts and contribute to the community health assessment. The Health Department must document that the preliminary findings of the state level community health assessment were distributed to the population at large and that their input was sought. Additionally, Measure 1.1.3 uh, in the guidance, uh, the health department must document how it communicates the community health assessment findings to the public. And so in our SHIP guidance and resource document, um, we highlight the many ways uh, our states have communicated their SHIP. So some examples are uh, the Illinois Department of Public Health and SHIP partnership are, are by state law are required to hold at least three public hearings on the draft SHIP. The state holds hearings in the northern, central, and southern regions of the state and some members of the SHIP team attend each hearing. The SHIP team reviews a summary report of themes, issues, and concerns from the hearings and makes additions and adjustments to the SHIP based on public input. A second example is from the Connecticut Department of Public Health, and they held eight community forums across the state seeking public input. They also conducted one online meeting in Spanish to allow for additional participation from across the state. Following the release, the Connecticut Department of Public Health conducted interactive webinars for each priority area with advisory council and workgroup stakeholders. Our third example is from Washington State and they publish a quarterly newsletter that shares overall SHIP updates, SHIP progress and activity related to the SHIP priorities. The Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has an active social media presence for its SHIP. And as shown in Figure 5.3 on your screen in the lower left corner, um, Maryland SHIP has a Twitter account that provides timely information and updates related to SHIP priorities. So those are just some highlights from our document, our guidance and resource document. So now I am happy to turn uh, the presentation over to Carolyn in Alabama. So Carolyn, go ahead. Thank you, Denise, and hello, everybody. We are also going to start with a polling question for um, my, my part of the presentation, which is priority setting. So I'd like you all to look at the screen, and I see some people are polling now and take a couple of minutes. And this is where are you in the SHIP process? Okay, we'll give you another couple of minutes, couple of seconds. All right, let's see where we are. Okay, so it looks like most of you have completed it over a year ago. Um, we do have some that are under development and just getting started. So I'd like to get your input for those people that are you know that have completed it um, after my presentation and sort of you know or at the end with questions and let them know of maybe some other priority um, approaches that you all use. So I'd like to. Um, 
start off with how I felt about priority setting with all of our many varied stakeholders. It's like eating a taco. So when you eat a taco, if you eat it over tortilla, when stuff falls out, you get another taco. So in this process, you never know what's going to come out of it. And we always have surprises. Um, and I also just wanted to, to show you how we define priority setting. It's a process. We know it involves stakeholders. And I think one of the major things that helps people in the priority setting process is to not have the same old people at the table. I don't know about everybody in the audience, but when I go to meetings, we seem to have similar conversations. It's the same leaders that come to the meetings. And so we did a lot of work so that our stakeholders that came to a priority setting meeting were, were very different than the ones that we see at meetings. Um, and really know what their concerns are. Um, we also, it's also a process that takes into account what needs we need to focus on. So we had four guiding principles that we used um, in priority setting. The first one is that we recognize that everybody comes to the table with a bias. And so that is one of the reasons that we really wanted diverse stakeholders we really wanted people outside of, of the healthcare arena that we see at meetings. And that was also a reason that we did select the QSort process because we felt like probably all the concerns that were going to be brought up in this process were going to be very important to people in Alabama. So by doing QSort, it allowed us to rank even when all issues are of equal importance. Our next guiding principle was um, we considered the organizational and community assets and resources as we selected our top priorities. Um, as you know, uh, in all states we have budgetary challenges, we have political challenges, whether it's on the local or the state level. Um, we also look at social determinants of health. And we also look at political will. So as an example, our number six healthcare concern um, from our community needs assessment was sexually transmitted infections. Um, we lead the nation um, in sexually transmitted infections. Our county is one of the top counties in the entire country. But we knew that the political will and the community climate was not ready for STI education. Um, if any of y'all are from Alabama or have been to Alabama, we are in the Bible Belt. Um, we only educate around abstinence. So in setting a priority with this very um, challenging STI issue, um, we knew that that was not a priority. Looking at our community, our organizational assets and resources, our, the political will, that that was something we could not prioritize as one of our top three priorities. So I think that's important. Um, the third guiding principle that we looked at is making sure that the people in the room, because we did have district attorneys represented, we had mayors represented, we had city councils of government represented, we had um, we don't have a whole lot of grant makers in our in Alabama. Some of your states are much more robust, but we had grant makers in the room, we had um, businesses in the room. So when we presented our community health needs assessment data and measures before we asked them to rank the top three health care priorities for Alabama. So if just pulling one of our health care concerns, uh, nutrition and physical activity was one of our health care concerns. So we not only had information in adult obesity broken down by um, public health area, historic trend, age, gender, race, income, education. We also looked at adults consuming fruit less than once daily. We looked at adults consuming vegetables less than one daily. These are all Burfus measures that you all are familiar with. Um, and we also looked at adults participating in enough aerobic and muscle strengthening exercises to meet guidelines. So. We had um, several indicators that we selected, and we spent about the first 30 to 45 minutes of our stakeholder meeting just going over 
each of our we had top 13 healthcare concerns that we were trying to get to top three, and we made sure they had enough information um, so that they could make, uh, you know, a decision based on what our state looked like. So right now I'm showing you the 13 leading healthcare concerns from the child process in Alabama. Um, and as you can see, this is ranked in order of how, um, of our analysis of our surveys. We also did community focus groups, we talked to other organizational, um, other organizations, and so this was not just our population, it was communities and organizations that were included in this collection process. And I'm sure you heard about that last week. Um, the fourth guiding principle that um, we used is, is is that we didn't want to focus on a healthcare issue that we really couldn't make a significant impact in. So I use STI as an example. Oral health may be another example that I can use. Um, oral health was one of our healthcare priorities, but we do not have a robust adult oral healthcare system in Alabama. We have virtually no adult oral health through our Medicaid system. Um, so you know, when we're looking comprehensively, we could look at oral health for children, but we really couldn't capture the adult population because we just didn't have the infrastructure. You know, once we identify people that need oral health care, where were, where were we going to send them? So those were things that were brought up during our data and community needs assessment presentation. So those were our four guiding principles. Um, we decided on the QSORT method, and I know we have sent out a three-page handout on this, um, because when all concerns are important and there's a lot of subjective thought that goes into this, you come in with your own issues being a priority. I was access to care so that I knew that if I was going to prioritize something, it would be my program that I would, would put at the top. So this method does force choices where differences in importance may be quite small. And so that was really something we were very concerned about. As stakeholders, just to review, sorted their priority concerns, we looked at perceived need, likelihood of making a significant difference, and anticipated level of engagement. So here is a picture of our card. We had um, we invited, I think, about 80 people to our priority setting process. We had 59 people that came, um, very diverse stakeholder group, and we had 59 set of cards that you see in front of you. They were all labeled 1 to 13, and so each person took these cards and picked their top three priorities. Then we gave people, after that, we gave people a break. Um, while we had three UAB public health professors tabulating the results, and the way that the QSORT does that is that we have these five areas. And so your highest priority, you get a number in that, and you see there's only one block. Priority number two is three blocks. Priority number three is five. And so you get several issues that may be on the same level. Um, this was done. Um, this is a sample completed log sheet. Um, so everybody had their cards, and then they logged it into this log sheet. And so you can see by the log sheet um, that several different things, four, two, three, um, you know, we're all in line for that particular person. They thought those were all of equal importance. So what the professors helped us with is they were getting, they were tabulating all of these log sheets and through their computers, and then a mean priority score was calculated for each healthcare concern. This is a sample of what was calculated, and the lower the mean score, the higher priority. So you can see that we came up our top priorities from these 59 very diverse stakeholders were access to care, nutrition and physical activity, mental health and substance abuse. Now, mental health and substance abuse is a difficult 
it's a very complicated issue for us to address. So if you if you remember where we looked at, you know, sort of our four priority setting principles, we wanted to make sure that we could make some kind of impact in this area. So num the next one down, poor pregnancy outcomes for public health, would have been a much easier topic for us to work on through a community health improvement plan because we do do a lot around poor pregnancy outcomes. Um, we do have with the mental health and substance abuse, we do have the prescription drug monitoring program in public health, but our laws prevent us from getting any data out of it. Um, so we knew there were some limitations with that. But what we had to remember is this is not about public health. The Community Health Improvement Plan is a stakeholder-driven plan. This is what the stakeholders wanted in Alabama. And so we knew we would have to go ahead and work with the stakeholders to develop objectives and goals that would fit, you know, our stakeholder resources and assets along with public health stakeholder resources and assets. Um, I will tell you that um, one of the things that the stakeholders wanted to do was to have every primary care provider in Alabama do a depression screening. Now, if you all work with primary care providers at this point in time, they are overwhelmed with their EHR, with meaningful use, with transformation in the healthcare system. And so I went, so, so I think public health has a role when your stakeholders come up with a plan that you need to vet it and make sure it's a reasonable plan. So I went out to the associations and met with the Medical Association of Alabama, the Alabama Family Practice Association, the Alabama Academy of Pediatrics, and said, is this something you all think is viable in this environment that we're in in Alabama with our primary care providers? And they all said no. So that's what we have to sort of do to help guide within our priorities to help guide what those goals and objectives are. Um, so that's just an example of something we had to do in Alabama. Um, what we did at the end in the same day, because we felt like we had people from all over the state, they were, they were, they think they're very important people. <laughs> we think they're very important people too. So we wanted to honor their time commitment. So then we divided up into three different work groups to go ahead and develop our goals, objectives, performance measures, timelines, assets, and resources. Now, what I will tell you on this, we thought we had three different people to help the group through this. And what we did is when you allow self-selection of groups, we had a lot of people in access to care. We had a nice size group in mental health and substance abuse. And we had a very small group in nutrition and physical activity. And our facilitators, if I had to do this again, what I would recommend to state is you make sure you have facilitators for each of those groups that can handle strong personalities. Um, we had drama in the nutrition and physical activity group between two different people who had very strong personalities and sort of ran over everybody else in that smaller group. So my recommendation is, that you make sure you sort of have a plan for those facilitators and that they know how to handle strong people. Um, access to care group was over 35 people that we had in that group, and it went extremely well. So, we, so it was really sort of strange that the smaller group was the one we had the most challenge with. Um, and we did come out with um, goals, objectives, performance measures, assets, and resources. We did not come out with timelines. And so that was something that we handled. We do all of our uh, work group meetings via conference call um, because that is more convenient for our stakeholders. And we have added several stakeholders on after this process. Um, on my last Access to Care conference call, I had 40 people that attend via conference call, so it's a very robust meeting. Um, and what I would recommend is that if you don't you know, have full plans developed, that you take whatever you have and then you sort of vet some of the stuff like I did with uh, de depression screening for primary care providers and make sure everything can be done that our stakeholders want done. 
If it can't be, you bring it back to the work group and say, this is something we cannot do. Let's look at an alternative. So that's how we've handled that. And as I said, we do um, conference calls. Um, the QSORT handout uh, goes into much more detail that we've given you. And I am happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Carolyn. We appreciate you sharing that. And I, I feel sure there will be some interesting questions about that method. Um, so our next presenter is James from Oklahoma. So James, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, good morning everyone or afternoon depending on which side of the country you are listening in from. I want to focus now on communicating with stakeholders about both the development of your State Health Improvement Plan and then also in its implementation. So I want to hit this from both angles. And it was nice to see that polling question a while ago. It looks like our numbers were pretty evenly divided, I think, between those of you who are in the process of beginning or you're in the development process for your ship, as well as those who may have had it in place for a while. And I think a lot of times when we look at strategic plans, we have so much focus on getting them developed, it's almost as if, okay, so what happens, you know, life after the plan's developed? Are we really moving toward implementation and achieving those outcomes and communicating the fact that we have achieved these outcomes? Uh, that way we have this complete cycle of uh, continuing that, that public support for our plans because the public sees the outcomes that are being produced. So let me now introduce another polling question for us today. If you would, please answer, what strategies did you use to communicate your SHIP priorities? So those of you who have your plans developed or those of you who are in process, what, uh, what uh, strategies have you typically used to communicate these? I'll give us just a moment to complete. Have some results coming in. We'll give us just a few more seconds. Okay, let's take a look at our results now. So it looks like uh, the information age has certainly hit. We are uh, pretty high on uh, Internet as a source of uh, communication for our SHIP priorities, uh, followed then by public hearings and regional listening sessions. So it's exciting to see both of those. Uh, newsletters, uh, looks like that uh, has not really bubbled up. I don't have anybody indicating that. So I think part of this is just a sign of the information age and the way that we are able to use electronic uh, media to reach our stakeholders. But it's good to see, and we always want to keep in mind, that we do not want the Internet to take the place of having these public hearings and these regional listening sessions. So it's good to see that we have, have both of those here. And uh, of course we have a, a good number who have not yet begun communication, so it's a great time to be having this, this conversation. So as we're looking at our SHIP, and for Oklahoma, we call ours OHIP, the Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan. And uh, some of the information for those of you who may have been on the call a couple of weeks ago, I'll have a little bit of similar information, but I'm going to take it in a different direction this time. And when I talk about our State Health Improvement Plan, I'll be talking primarily about our OHIP 2.0. In other words, this is our second State Health Improvement Plan. We did complete one in the year 2009 as well. And that was the SHIP that our accreditation or that was used in our accreditation process when the Oklahoma State Department of Health was accredited back uh, early in 2013. So I will do a little bit of compare and contrast, but we largely used a very similar process of communicating with our stakeholders in both cases. So uh, in the development of our health improvement plan, we wanted to, of course, engage communities in this process. And it can be a challenge often at the outset uh, you know, to ask members, especially of the public, and that's really who we wanted to target. Yes, we did also have service providers. We had experts in the field. 
but we also wanted to just hear from the general public. And if I just put up a sign that asked the public, hey, come help us develop a statewide strategy for health improvement, that may not sound like you know, the most exciting thing I could perhaps do with my evening, but if we frame this in terms of please give us your input. We want to hear what you have to say about the health of your community and the health of our state. And so we very often would pair state health improvement with local health improvement. Uh, you've heard of the expression, all politics is local. Oftentimes, all health is local or feels local. And so while we're wanting to look at this, of course, from a statewide perspective, communities really get engaged and people tend to really get engaged when they see how this happens on Main Street, and we want to hear about what's happening on Main Street. And so to communicate to them the process we were using, uh, we would often refer to this as a recipe. We have three ingredients that are coming together to develop a health improvement plan. Uh, we need to see, you know, the top version there is kind of what I would call the scientific definition. So we have our quantitative data, which is our health outcome data. It's hospital discharge data, birth and death records, disease uh, prevalence across the state, our uh, BRFIS and Euthyphrous Behavior Surveys, those survey instruments. It tells us what's happening. We have the qualitative data that tells us why or, or what do we think is behind the numbers that we see. Uh, again, a, a list of hospital discharge data does not tell us why this person ended up there to begin with, but the qualitative data certainly can do that. And then we combine that with evidence-based practice, what the science says that we know to be effective if I'm trying to reduce adult tobacco prevalence or if I'm trying to uh, improve birth outcomes in the state. So the way we describe that is, uh, our state has a document uh, that we produce called the State of the State's Health. and uh, you know, Oklahomans are, uh, as we are nationally, we're used to hearing the State of the Union address by the President. We have a State of the State address, as many of you do, by your governors. And so we tagged on with that name, the State of the State's Health. And you will hear, I think, kind of a recurrent theme here today is to use very talkable language, both in the development and then especially in the implementation and communication of your plan. So we have our State of the State's Health plus what we called community chats. These were essentially our town hall meetings. We used a nominal group process to use the list uh, from our previous uh, presenter. That was the process that, that we employed. And then pulling together work groups composed of those content experts. So to give you a feel for uh, you know, where we uh, went with these chats, we essentially, uh, and I'll uh, do a briefer version this time uh, than what I did before in describing this, but we held sessions across the state and with different populations. So we have some uh, populations where we see health disparities uh, in Oklahoma. We are also home to 38 federally recognized Indian tribes. And so we held consultations government to government, state of Oklahoma with tribal nation around joint efforts around health improvement. And uh, then we also had a series of online surveys in which we uh, gathered input around three primary questions, whether these were surveys or whether it was part of our nominal group process. Question number one, what is your vision for a healthy community? What does that look like to you? Question number two, why aren't we there today? What barriers are getting in the way? And then question number three, what do we need to do as a community, as a state to help address those barriers? And so in collecting that information and then uh, you know, boiling it down, again, using some of the processes described earlier, we arrived at our priorities for our health improvement plan. Uh, this is just a visual representation. Uh, I know those of you not uh, from the state, uh, you know, a list of towns is somewhat meaningless if you, unless you know where they are. So you can see here we hit uh, primarily the uh, four quadrants of our state as well as our two uh, urban areas, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And now the way that we communicated both the uh, availability or the occurrence of these chats, but then also uh, the way that we continually uh, communicate our health improvement plan is through uh, really the, the boots on the ground. Uh, we have individuals working locally toward these efforts. Uh, with Oklahoma State Department of Health, and it uh, doesn't necessarily need to be through a state agency, other groups can do this as well, but uh, we do have partnerships with community coalitions across the state, and we have a network of partnership consultants through uh, this network that we call Turning Point. 
the name Turning Point just simply means it was a shift in philosophy from being a very top-down approach. Oklahoma is a primarily centralized state in the way that its health department is set up. So we have a central administration office and then a network of county health departments. But then uh, this way we have six, uh, about uh, 15 individuals across the state who represent uh, the counties that you see listed there. And they are consultants to both community partners, coalitions, businesses, uh, other networks to really help uh, you know, focus public health efforts and combine what may be uh, happening at the central office through maybe some evidence-based practice, but really connecting that to the community players who are key to helping this be successful at the local level. And so our Turning Point consultants were our primary recruiters for these community chats and uh, also our uh, sort of the local voice for our state health improvement plan. In addition to that, we have, as many of you do, your CHIP, your uh, County Health Improvement Plan or Community Health Improvement Plan. And I think it's very helpful to have those CHIPs and to have some alignment or connection between your CHIP and your State Health Improvement Plan. Because what this does uh, is it helps connect this statewide plan locally. So here's what the Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan looks like in Anadarko, Oklahoma, or in Grove, Oklahoma. Here is, uh, here's the list of partners we have available. Here's who's at the table. Here's who has been participating. We don't want to overdo this to the point that our communities are basically echoing our state health improvement plan in its entirety because there are some differences community to community, region to region, as you are, are well familiar. But at least I, it helps provide a framework and helps us have that talkable language that I mentioned. Uh, so for example, whether it's our state health improvement plan or one of our community health improvement plans in development, many times we will see, as we did, tobacco use becomes a primary issue for us, as does physical activity, as does nutrition. And so we came up with some talkable phrases for that. Eat better, move more, be tobacco free. And that becomes, although it's very, very simplistic, it helps to just have that message inserted in as many conversations that we can. Our governor even uses that, uh, that phrasing, eat better, move more, be tobacco free. Uh, we also, as you're familiar with the term, make the healthy choice the easy choice. We love that phrase because if I wanted to give that elevator speech of what our health improvement plan was about, I have 30 seconds to describe it. Go. All right. We want to help Oklahomans make the healthy choice the easy choice. And part of the way we do that is uh, eating better, moving more, and being tobacco free and helping to equip our communities so that those do become those easy choices. So I just cannot emphasize enough the importance of, although your plans may be very complex in nature, these are certainly not easy issues to address in a very simple format. The way we communicate it is uh, very easy to follow and very easy to connect with. So uh, I've gotten ahead of myself just a little bit on the slides, but the way that we recruited our participants for these community chats were through our regional turning point consultants as well as some offices uh, that we have, uh, our minority health office uh, for our health disparities groups, as well as our tribal liaison uh, who works with our commissioner and also with the governor's office in the way that we interface and connect with our tribal nations, as you see in addition then to our online survey. So in rolling out your state health improvement plan, and, and this is key, the first time Oklahoma wrote a health improvement plan, it was at the bequest of our legislature. The House Joint Resolution was passed in 2009 directing the Oklahoma State Board of Health to develop a five-year strategic plan to improve Oklahoma's health. Uh, that was a great opportunity for us because, you know, along the way, accreditation came along and we had all these other, other needs that uh, we could really start to you know, coalesce around this health improvement plan. When it came time to roll out that plan, we did it at the state capitol. In, in the blue room, which is the big room where the governor always uh, makes big announcements. And so this was announced by the governor in the blue room of the Capitol. And there was a lot of excitement around our health improvement plan. The second time around, however, we wanted to take a very different approach. 
uh, we were no longer uh, responding to a legislative request. We had uh, basically filled that, but of course we were going to continue with a health improvement plan. And knowing that we needed to update this plan for our next five-year period, we went through the process that I just described in, in creating this, this new version of our health improvement plan. But this time, instead of rolling it out at a state capital, we wanted to roll it out on Main Street. And so uh, we had a list of communities that have really seen some local health outcome improvement, as well as have really uh, made a lot of changes in their communities. So we had a town called Noble, and that name Noble really describes that community. This has been a wonderful community to work with. It's a relatively small town, um, probably about uh, three or 4,000 uh, residents. And their schools uh, went tobacco-free 24-7. They also have passed city ordinances. Uh, they have also uh, really worked with their libraries and, and other uh, community venues to promote health. And uh, their city manager has been very on board. Their superintendent has been very on board with health. So we thought, what a great opportunity to roll out our health improvement plan in a local community that can really serve as an example of what other towns can do. You don't have to be a metropolitan area. You don't have to be a community with a lot of money to make things happen. And we brought in state officials, as you see here. We did bring in our tribal officials as well, uh, city leaders, and of course, students, those uh, directly impacted and uh, involved in these efforts locally. And that is also where we launched our website. So back to our polling question, a lot of you have used the Internet, and I certainly uh, encourage that. Uh, OHIP2020.com is the website location for our health improvement plan. And you can uh, encourage you to go there if you want to read our entire report. We were very intentional on making this a brief report, although there is a lot of wiring behind the, the radio dials, if you will. We wanted to have it such that the public can simply turn it on find their station, turn up the volume when they see what they really want to hone in on. So it's very user friendly. I encourage you to go to the website. Something that we also would like to do with our website, I would uh, encourage you to try this as well. However, we are in a, a significant state budget crunch right now, so we've had to put this part on hold. But I mentioned these community health improvement plans. We uh, have our vision to link these plans through our OHIP 2020 website. So if I'm sitting in Noble, Oklahoma, and I'm looking at the State Health Improvement Plan, and I'm excited perhaps about what I see there, I can also find a link to my county or my community, and I can find out what's happening specifically in my area around a county health improvement plan. I can see when they meet, how I can get involved, uh, who the team leads are and really be able to plug in and do something with the information I see. I can take that call to action and really begin to move with it. Uh, then I'll get to a couple of other pieces uh, that we really try to communicate on this website as well. So uh, the way that uh, we structure this, and I've got a slide that lays this out visually for you. Uh, we do have an overall governance structure for our health improvement plan, and one of its primary purposes, of course, is to link with our, our community health improvement plans locally, but then also provide a way for us to communicate to the public as we go forward with our health improvement plan. These are outcomes that uh, we are beginning to see, and, but then also these are some initiatives uh, in which we are beginning to engage and partner. And part of this team, this is not just the Oklahoma State Department of Health, and we're very intentional about that. Uh, this is a statewide health improvement plan. Yes, we use it to develop our strategic plan, which guides our business plan, the way that we operate as an agency, but this is a private-public partnership, and we actually say the word private first because we really want to emphasize community partnerships and our private partners in this process. So to give you just a very brief, this is if I wanted to describe our health improvement plan visually, this is how I would do it. We have a, this network of private-public partnerships. As you can see, we have four flagship issues, tobacco use, obesity, child health, behavioral health, similar to what we saw with, uh, with Alabama. Uh, in order to achieve outcomes along those flagship issues, we work with health systems. So you see health transformation, which is uh, in broad terms, as we're seeing nationally, moving from a very volume-based uh, reimbursement system and, and structure around health care to one that focuses more on value or outcome, and then health education. 
also, so those are the systems necessary to achieve those flagship priorities, but then we also need to pay attention to social determinants <clears throat> because we know that these uh, flagship issues are uh, you know, very complex. And so when we look at education attainment and job creation, those were two elements within the social determinants of health that we thought were also very key to success in these areas. And so in very simple terms, that's what our health improvement plan looks like, and that's something that we're able to easily communicate uh, to our stakeholders. In fact, I'm going to go back for just a moment. We did create a two-page summary that's also on our website. So again, if I wanted to have that elevator conversation with someone, just a front to back, here are our priorities, here are the core measures and benchmarks we aim to achieve, and here's why. And that's, the message is that simple. And then, of course, here's how to connect and get involved. Um, again, you see here, uh, one of my boxes looks like it was a little too small here. Uh, this is just the governance structure we have for our plan. So we have an overall team that, that guides this, but then we have our flagship work groups and then our systems work groups. And this is the information that will begin to pipe in to our website so that people can stay updated on, on what's happening around to, uh, tobacco, around obesity, around child health as we look at policy issues. Uh, around these topics. Our legislature is in session as we speak, and many of these topics are, are being discussed uh, within the legislature. It provides a way for people to identify, and we will often get calls, people who are interested not necessarily in the whole plan, but they are interested in obesity, or they are interested in child health, or even more specifically, infant mortality. So we can direct them here, and here's how they can get involved, and then connect that to their local community health improvement plans in the process. So let me talk just a little bit now about uh, the benefits of uh, really having a good talkable plan as part of your FAB review. Our experience has been that uh, FAB is interested just in as much in the process as they are in the content of your plan. I can have a very beautifully written plan that has all of the objectives, all of the benchmarks, all of the evidence-based practice. It's a wonderful plan. But if I am not able to provide any evidence that the community had input on this, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to be in, in a tight spot there because this is not about us just putting a great plan together because we think it's great. The community needs to be in the process from the beginning. And so again, that doesn't just mean that we write a plan and put it out for public comment. Uh, you absolutely want to make public comment part of your process. But that's after the fact. Uh, that's after it's been written. We uh, wanted to bring people in with our blank slate and just hear from them what are the issues you're seeing in your communities. And it was interesting. The quantitative data, I meant, data that I mentioned, that told me what was happening. But we didn't hear a lot of that from our uh, listening sessions. The data told us about cardiovascular disease. Uh, the data tells us about cancer. The community chats told us about things like food deserts, and we have no safe place for our children to be physically active, things that certainly lead to those outcomes. But if I were just looking at numbers on a page, I would have never been able to glean what we got from communities. And provide evidence that you're doing this. Uh, it's easy to forget in the process of really reaching out to communities to document all of this along the way. So have sign-in sheets every time you have a community chat. Have minutes for these sessions, ways to document the proceedings of these meetings. Who was there? Who did they represent? Were they with a community organization? Um, were they a professional in the field? Were they somebody who's been affected? Or is this someone who holds what I call a DDH degree, a deep desire to help, and that is their connection to this process? Provide that documentation. Uh, that's what FAB really wants to see. And they want to see that your health department leadership is involved in all aspects of this development. This is not just a plan that they signed off on. Uh, this is not just a plan that they had kind of a general oversight with. But they were participating in this entire process. They were with those listening sessions. In fact, our Commissioner of Health was at every single one of these sessions and really helped lead the group in getting the ball rolling. We had an outside facilitator who actually conducted the nominal group process. But our Commissioner uh, was there for every single chat and every step of the process, very visibly so and meaningfully so. So be sure that all of this is documented as you uh, you know, move these, uh, these listening sessions forward. 
and uh, be ready to you know, answer questions about how that engagement took place. So all that to just, uh, I guess, summarize with, uh, you know, start early, engage uh, from the get-go, but don't forget once your plan is written that engagement really needs to continue. Uh, you didn't see it on the screen, but we uh, created a public information officer subgroup of our health improvement team as well, so that uh, whenever we issue press releases, or uh, whenever things are happening locally, that's our way to communicate and keep that information flowing uh, across the plan and across our partnerships. And so uh, just wanted to uh, leave you with that. Uh, make this a very talkable plan. Uh, you know, keep your audience in mind and uh, engage them every step of the way. So use that electronic media. Uh, if you have Facebook, uh, Twitter, use those uh, ways to, to reach out as well. But don't let that take the place of that personal touch and having these local listening sessions, but then also helping people get involved locally uh, through your community health improvement plans or your county health improvement plans as well. And that will conclude my, my session. Thanks so much. Um, Thanks so much, uh, James, for your presentation. Uh, as well as Carolyn, uh, we do appreciate you sharing your, your ship journey with the group. Um, now it's time for Q&A. So I would encourage folks to um, speak directly with our presenters to ask your question, or you can uh, alternatively send your question through the chat function. So um, operator, can you please open the lines now? Certainly. If you would like to ask an audio question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. So while we're waiting uh, for the operator to queue up questions, we do have a question that came through the chat function. This is from Loretta Kelly in New Jersey, uh, the New Jersey Department of Health in Trenton. Um, this is for you, Carolyn. Did you hold – I'm sorry, excuse me, this is for James. Um, James, did you hold community chats in all 15 regions, and were there more than one chat? Was there more than one chat per region? Yes, yes, good question. For our state health improvement plan, we did not hold them in all 15 of the regions. <clears throat> uh, we had the uh, just the 11 that you see listed there. Uh, absolutely, uh, we certainly wanted to have more than that. Uh, this was simply uh, you know, within our, our time frame, which I think a lesson learned there is give yourself plenty of time to pull these together and, and have, these, uh, have these chats held. But uh, that did limit us to the 11. Now at the community health improvement plan level, uh, we do have these, uh, we use what's called the MAP process. Many of you may be familiar with that, mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships. And those do occur in all, all 15 of these regions across the state. Thanks, James. There are um, no other questions at this time. I'm sorry, there are none? No. Okay, so we'll continue on with some other chat questions. Um, Carolyn, to you, we have a question around who decided on the QSort method. What, what, was the, what, were some, what were the reasons for choosing that prioritization method? And then what were the challenges associated with it? I think the major challenge is just making sure that you're able to process all of those worksheets that you know we we gave you a sample sheet, um, and that had to we had to have 59 of those processed very very quickly during the break time, so that was the biggest challenge. I love the approach because everybody individually worked on that, and they were able to really represent. You know, we know people are going to be biased in what they think is most important based on what they do and where they're coming from, but I felt like they really had the opportunity to um, take some very, very important issues but reflect it in a way that the bias did not come through. So that's why we like the QSort process um, because, you know, we felt like it was, it was an easy way to make a call on some healthcare issues that are all important. And Great, thanks. Our, our group, our 59 people that participated, 
just loved the process. So everybody really felt heard. And Carolyn, I actually, I actually have a follow-up question for you on that. Um, you mentioned that you worked with the uh, UAB professors to do the calculations. Were they, had, were they already familiar with this methodology, or you know, did they have to learn it? How, how did that all come to fruition? No, these were all professors from the, the – we have our School of Public Health at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and they were also our consultants on the project, and so they were very, very familiar with this. Three of them were working the computers, and they did this very, very quickly. I think if it was left to, to um, our staff alone, that it would not have gone so smoothly. So yes, we used an outside consultant to help us with that. And they were very familiar with the process. Great. So then you would not recommend that this is something that the, the um, health department staff uh, do on their own? On their own, yes. Yeah, I just think it depends on how you set up your meeting. Um, and everybody has sort of a different approach for this. So we, we had quite a robust agenda that we had set out for that face-to-face -face stakeholder meeting. Um, and so we did not have a lot of time that was buffered in. I think you, you might be able to use your IT people or people who are familiar from your epidemiology people. Um, who might be familiar with the process, you might be able to use staff, but I just think you'd have to have a different kind of agenda um, and give them ample time to do the tabulation. Thanks, Carolyn. James, uh, let, me, let me, before I go on to James, um, operator, are there any audio questions? There are no questions at this time. Okay, thank you. James, uh, since, you, since Oklahoma is a, an accredited state health agency now, can you tell us uh, in, the last, um, in the last closing minutes of our, of our webinar, what, what were some important um, lessons learned from, from the FAB site visit specifically around your ship? Yes, yes. Uh, so the team was very pleased to see our documentation um, around our health improvement plan. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's very important to document who's in attendance, uh, where they come from, uh, and what they really commented on is that they, you know, we had a list of participants who were involved in the plan development process, including representatives from various organizations and agencies. We had the minutes provided. Uh, and then they saw that we also did send this out for public comment and have this available. Something else we learned is in our subsequent years of reporting back to them, so once you are accredited, you will be required to submit annual reports. And uh, there will be some, you know, some questions that, the, that FAB asks you as part of that, but then also is to, you know, we like to report back on some of the items within the health improvement plan that they identified that we maybe needed a little more work, and one of those was our work with uh, our tribal nations in Oklahoma. And so as a result of uh, our plan, we actually created a Tribal Public Health Advisory Committee because there were several issues raised in tribal consultation that uh, we wanted to include. Yes, these were needs we had within the plan, but we wanted to demonstrate to FAB that we have actually taken that guidance they gave us and we have turned these issues that were raised into a mechanism to help solve them. And so with the numerous tribes that we had, we created this committee that has representatives from the different types of tribes, not each tribe, but the different types of tribes, uh, large, small, direct service, IHS, self-governance tribes. And they, uh, this group has started to really kind of tackle one by one those issues addressed when we engaged in tribal consultation as part of putting our plan together. So it was not just collecting a lot of input from communities, but now here is what is happening with that input. Here's the work that's taking place going forward. But documentation is key, and documenting that you had your community partners on board start to finish, and how we then married that input with what the numbers uh, were telling us and letting them see what that process looked like. Uh, so the more homework you do at the beginning, the fewer questions the team will have when they come visit you, and in particular around your health improvement plan. 
Very good. Very helpful. Thank you, James. And so I'm looking at the time. We're actually a little bit over time. There were a couple of other questions that came through the chat function, and so um, we will follow up individually with those folks and get your questions answered by our presenters. Um, so we do have to conclude the webinar. Once again, we want to thank James and Carolyn uh, for for their great presentations. We want to thank our funders and of course you all out there, our participants, um, for the robust discussion. So if you are in need of further information about developing a shift or other topics, uh, you can contact me at the uh, address listed on the slide. And once again, we value your feedback, so please take a few moments to provide us with your feedback on today's webinar. Thank you, and that concludes today's session. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you for participating in today's conference call. You may now disconnect your lines at this time. Presenters, please hold.